Okay, everyone, uh, let's begin. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce David Piles, who's the Director and Technical Research Project Manager for the Chevron Center for Research Excellence at the Colorado School of Mines. He happens to be a former student of mine, so I'm particularly pleased that he's willing to give this talk. And I will turn it over to Dave. There you go. Well, uh, James, for, thanks very much for the introduction. And I also want to thank Irina for inviting me to give this talk. It is a pleasure to speak with you today about my perspectives on modeling, and particularly uh, as uh, I am a field geologist and not a modeler. But one thing I would like to do is walk you through some ideas that I have in terms of how measurements that field geologists make can can at least uh, collaborate with and contribute to forward modeling. I'd also like to thank um, my co-authors, particularly Kyle Straub, and who has contributed to a, a, a part of this talk, and then Doug Edmonds, who were just starting off some collaborations as well. I'd also like to thank some inspiration uh, from some modelers, such as Bill Ross, James Savitsky, Irene Overeem, and Michael Perch. Not to single anyone out, but I think a lot of the work they're doing has uh, certainly inspired me as a field geologist. So uh, what I'd like to share with you today is a review of some techniques that can be used to evaluate model and outcrop uncertainty and test natural variability in sediment transport systems. And I'd also like to share with you a vision of how field geologists and modelers can leverage from each other's perspectives. And I show some neat images of, of some field areas for you. Up in the top is the book cliffs, uh, a great outcrop in Utah. Down in the bottom left is uh, the, the uh, Wasatch Formation in Utah, and then this is a great example of a, of a deep water system that we're working in California. So um, in terms of putting some context for you, we all know very well that there's a number of ways to address stratigraphic problems. And you know, my world is here as, the, as an outcrop stratigrapher, but most of you in the room, I think, are numerical modelers, or you can, therefore you're using numerical simu simulations. There's physical experimentation. That's an important way to work uh, in addressing stratigraphic problems. There's obviously subsurface studies. Uh, I think the top images are pretty self-explanatory. This bottom left image is an is a amplitude map, a seismic amplitude map of a mini basin in Gulf of Mexico. And then there's obviously land and seascape studies. And what I re really mean there is like modern systems. And at least in my perspective, in, in, in my experience, what I see is very strong relationships between uh, numerical simulations and the land, seascape, or modern studies. And I think the, the previous keynote was a, a great example how the modern landscape is being used to test the efficacy of models and vice versa. And certainly, there's a lot of research done relating physical experimentation to numerical simulations. Now, what I would like to share with you is some ideas that I have in terms of how outcrop stratigraphers and numerical modelers can work together to address common questions, but also to understand, uh, to test the efficacy of models. And you know, the whole idea of what I'm basically saying is very Aristotelian, meaning that the whole is different than the sum of the parts, in that if we gain knowledge from physical models, outcrops, subsurface studies, the whole shebang, we're going to be better off than, if, than any of the individual studies on their own, or if we had a number of small studies focused on a similar concept. I could also cite James Savitsky, which is the more that we know, or if, if a numerical output matches that of a physical or system, then we know that we're going in the right direction. And so that's what I want to share with you today is at least some of the perspectives I've had in terms of what, how we could compare, quantitatively compare measurements from outcrops to that of, of simulated studies. And again, this is just a perspective. So uh, there's a lot of work to do. Um, but to give a little bit of background on where I come from, there's a lot of recent technological advances in data collection techniques in, in field stratigraphy that have yielded opportunities to better quantify stratigraphic stacking patterns and spatial distributions of deposits of ancient sediment transport systems. One notable example would be LIDAR. LIDAR is a detailed XYZ grid of topography, basically. And what we've used in my team is a LIDAR machine, and we basically point it sideways at an outcrop so we can have a very strong or detailed image of the surface topography of the outcrop, which allows us to then quantify stratigraphic surfaces. So this is an example from some work I've done with uh, a colleague, Lauren Estrakin and David Jeanette, uh, in Ireland just very recently. And this is in press and in Geosphere. But the idea here is that you know, we're looking at a photograph on the top left of, of an outcrop 
within this big study area that we did. And then the LIDAR data image is on the bottom left, and then on the right there is the surface topography of this system, or of that local part of the outcrop. Well, this outcrop is highly complex. It's very large. It's a few kilometers in, in breadth. And what we can actually do in a computer model is track these stratigraphic surfaces and have detailed digits for how, say, a channel fill looks. We can also register with it grain size distributions if we want to, the types of physical sedimentary structures, which are a proxy for this, the depositional processes and so forth. Now, in this talk, I'm going to be focused more on, on surface stratigraphy, just to keep, it very, to keep this as simple as possible. Another, uh, other advances are photogrammetry. This is an image of the book cliffs. This, is a, uh, this cliff is about 500 meters tall. And what the, what the way that these images are, these models are made is by crossing the focal length, uh, the focal point of a camera so that you can build like a complex three-dimensional image literally out of photographs. And again, what this does, it creates a complex three-dimensional image that we can put, bring into a model and create surfaces for. And that's, again, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is, is surfaces and how we can use them. So one way I'd like to illustrate an example of how field geologists and numerical models can work together is through the concept of compensational stacking. And that's going to be the majority of what I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to show a vision of how we can do some stuff with deltas later. So in terms of compensational stacking, let me speak as a stratigrapher here is compensational stacking is a tendency for sediment transport systems to fill topographic lows. And that's the definition that Kyle Straub put out in his 2009 JSR article. It's an idea that we've been talking about for years, though, all the way back to Muti back in the 60s. The, this process of compensational stacking results in spatial changes in the locus of deposition via evulsion. So what I show here on this image is a, is a generalized diagram of a shelf to basin profile. Imagine it offshore Atlantic margin or Gulf of Mexico. And the idea is that you have a shelf, system, the shelf, and in this case it's basically a low stand, or in other words at low sea level, transferring off into the slope and into the basin. And what I want to focus on in particular on the shelf to basin profile are these distributive submarine fans which are common on I think all of Earth's siliciclastic continental margins. They can happen in interslope mini basins such as salt withdraw basins in the Gulf of Mexico. They can happen in extensional basins such as those offshore California. And they can happen out on the basin floor. And they contain channels and lobes that form a radially dispersive pattern. Shown here is a seismic image, the same one I showed earlier. And this is from Rick Boboff's study of the Brazos Trinity system. I'm going to use this to illustrate this process of compensational stacking for you. And what you're seeing here on this, this seismic data image is basically its, uh, its amplitude. And the orangish colors of the hot colors reflect sandstone, whereas the grayer colors reflect mudstone. This is a map view, and, and you see the scale bar on there. Now, what you see in terms of just a general pattern is that the channels are entering the basin on the, on the right, and they are forming a radially dispersive pattern where they transfer to lobes. But critically, this isn't just one time slice. We're looking at the result in stratigraphy that reflects an evolving landscape. And in particular, if you look closely, you'll see I'm going to throw in these numbers reflecting lobe 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And the process or the, the sequentiality of this is determined through superposition or cross-cutting relationships, which was derived from the seismic data. But my point here is that that radially dispersive pattern that you see is a result of a number of time steps. Let's look at this in cross-section to get a better idea of what this looks like. And now I'm going to show you some seismic data offshore Corsica in which you're looking at a shelf to basin profile where the shelf is up here, whoops, the slope goes down and then into the basin floor. And I'm going to show you this seismic line is just of one distributive fan in here. And this is from Deptuck's work in, in sedimentology. And the idea here is this is a seismic data image of lobes, which are those big paddle state things that we looked at in, cross, in map view on the previous slide. This is highly vertically exaggerated. I think it's probably about 1,000 to 1 vertical exaggeration, just to give you an idea here. But in terms of the sequentiality, you can see lobe 1, 2, 3, four, five, six. And do you guys see how this compensational stacking or the, set, the tendency of the sediment transport system to fill topographic lows is shifting the depot center of these units around through time? So this is really exciting to me because what it's suggesting is that there's a, a, there's a landscape evolution that can be derived from a cross-sectional field. 
So in terms of uh, where else does compensational stacking happen? Well, it happens in Delta, shown here as an offshoot of the Mississippi River Delta, in which compensational stacking is certainly part of that system. And I think we can all imagine Delta, as a lot of people have Delta experience here. Other systems are alluvial fans, or what Gary Wiseman would call distributive fluvial systems. And this is a, a landsat image in which you see an older part of the fan, which is no longer active, is shown in the darker colors, whereas the cool colors are the modern, modern active part of the active fan here. And again, the idea is that it shifted from the right to the left through time, and it's building this broad, radially dispersive pattern. Now, uh, this is cool, so, but how do we quantify it? And this is where my co-author Kyle comes in, in that Kyle in 2009 developed a metric for quantifying compensational stacking. And let me put this in context of where Kyle comes from. Well, first of all, he, he lives in Tulane, but in terms of his frame of reference is what I'd like to share with you. Kyle's a, a physical model, and what I show here is a snapshot of his delta basin on the right, in which you can see the active channel, at least at the time that this photograph is taken, is shown here on the, on the right side of the basin whereas the left part of the basin was abandoned. Well, during this experiment, what they were doing is rising base level, or in other words, subsiding the basin, and this cross-section shown here on the left is what the stratigraphy, the resultant stratigraphy looks like. So now what's interesting when you're, when you're modeling things is that you have full control over sediment flux, sediment accumulation rate, or you can measure sediment accumulation rates, you can measure substance rates. This is all programmed into the machinery. And so it's no surprise that when Kyle quantified compensational stacking, he was using this metric here, which is he calls sigma SS, in which the variables that quantified are local sedimentation rate, long-term subsidence rate, and that's scaled over the length of the cross-section. He then uses that to develop an exponential, it's an empirical fit of an exponential decay function. Now again, I really want to focus on these variables. It's local sedimentation rate and long-term subsidence rate. Let me show you how this works, just to develop an intuition that we're going to use for the rest of the talk. The idea here is if something's perfectly compensational, such as that on the bottom right image, you note that the this channel levy system is fl flying all over the place, like a brick wall, sort of, beautifully compensationally stacked. That would have a compensation index of one. However, if the sediment transport system is sticky or and just degrading, it would have a compensational index of zero. And then this diagram here shows something in between the two. So these lines on the graph are, are going to become more obvious when I start to fit this with real data from an outcrop. So now let's go back to the, oh, and by the way, one thing that when I first read this article, I was really floored by it. I love the idea of quantifying compensational stacking. And one thing that I learned a lot in, in this process, and I want to give you some insights in ter terms of uh, how modeling and field geology work together is that there's a lot of insight that can be gained from modeling. I never would have thought of quantifying compensational stacking had I not read this article. And so not once I read it, though, it taught me that I need to start observing different things in the stratigraphy, which is why I cite Darwin's correspondence with the geological survey, which was every observation must be made for or against some view if it is to be of service. But if you don't have that perspective, how can you know to measure it? So now what I want to share with you is well, I got excited about compensational stacking. You'll recall the variables are, are sedimentation rate and subsidence rate. But now enter the field air, the field geologies, a field geologist world which is something like what you see here. And this is a sea cliff from Ireland. So we know these rocks are 318 million years old. We can roughly derive the sediment, the, the subsidence rate, but it would be averaged over about a four million year duration, which is largely dissatisfying. So when I called Kyle up, I said, hey, is there any way that we can modify this? And so we worked together. We spent a weekend on doing a workshop. And then I went back out in the field and reevaluated some data. But what we tried here is refining the input variables to measure compensational stacking. And so what we did is we refined it so that the numerator now is local deposit thickness scaled over the mean depo deposit thickness between any two stratigraphic surfaces. So what we're doing now is we're ev evaluating this, this coefficient of variability for all pairwise combinations of surfaces that we could measure in an outcrop. We have an exponential decay function that's going to fit a best curve and that will define our compensation index, which is the exponent. So with that theory, I'd like to now describe for you how we compared the original method to the modified method. Again, the whole reason for modifying, what, modifying it was so that it would accommodate for the variables that we can measure in the field. And what I show here is, uh, again, the same uh, tank experiment that Kyle uh, put together. 
in which the, soup, the, the graph shown here at the top uses the old metric that uses subsidence rates and sedimentation rates. And the bottom, met, uh, the bottom best fit curve here is for our new coefficient of variability, which is using local over mean deposit thickness. Now, the bottom line here is that you'll see that the curve, the this, this system starts at a compensation index of 1, and it transfers at smaller scales to about 0 0.57 using the first index. And with our modified compensation index, we have basically the same values, although more error. And I should point out that this, these larger error bars that you see here are due to the deposit, the precision of the measuring instrument that we had. We're actually entering the one millimeter territory there on the left, which is the, the resolution of the, uh, the laser scanner that, that was used to measure this. So the bottom line I'm trying to say here is that we modified a metric from one that required omniscience of a, of a system to one that requires just simple ocular inspection or actually empiricism from an outcrop so we could have a common way of measuring an output of a model to that of a, of a natural sediment transport system. So now what I'd like to be do is um, share with you that because this is a surface approach, this is something that could be applied to any forward stratigraphic model. I show here a, an output from Michael Perch's paper in 2006. Mich Michael Perch has been focused on event-based or rule-based models. He gave a keynote here in two years ago, I believe it was. Is that right? And so, but the important thing about this type of modeling program is that he can track stratigraphic surfaces in the same way that 3D Sedflux, I believe, does as well. And this is an image from Irina's article in 2005. And then lastly, I believe this would also work for the stuff that Doug Edmonds and his colleagues are doing as well. And so the point is, is if we can m use surfaces and the thicknesses between surfaces, we might be able to measure model outputs with that in natural systems. So let me take you back to the outcrop. And first, what I'm going to do is use this methodology to address a question of how does compensational stacking vary spatially in a submarine fan? Or in other words, if I compare the up dip and down dip of the system, are they the same? And the second thing I'd like to do is describe how compensation varies by scale. Or in other words, if I were to look back into this cross section, you'll note that lobes 1 through 11 are highly compensational. But if I surgically extract and look deeply into lobe 1, do you note that the seismic reflections are all superimposed on one another, indicating possibly that compensational stacking is a scale-dependent process. Or in other words, it's not fractal. So we can test these ideas using outcrops. And so what I'd like to do now is take you to Ireland. And this is the Ross Sandstone system, which is about 380 million, 318 million years old. It's Nemurian in age. If you're European, it would be Pennsylvanian if you're American. And um, the formation was deposited within a ponded distributive submarine fan. And we've done a lot of work there in the past several years. What I'd like to do now is zoom in to a closer view of this geologic map, the area that's broadly yellow, which is where the Ross Sandstone crops out. And shown here is a geologic map of the peninsula, which is <clears throat> the yellow parts are the raw sandstone. Here's a couple images of the sea cliff exposures. The thing I want to emphasize here is, remember, we developed a surface-based approach for quantifying compensational stacking. So in order for this to be logically correct, we better be able to define surfaces very well. And what you can see on the sea cliff exposure is that the surfaces are remarkably well exposed. Here's another example of a sea cliff exposure there. So what I want to do now is just take you to two different areas of this outcrop system. An area called Rhinevilla Point, which is predominantly channels, and an area called Kelbaha Bay, which is predominantly lobes. So recall on that distributive fan system that I showed you from the seismic image, the channels longitudinally transfer to lobes along their longitudinal transect. And so that's, that's what we're looking at, we're going to be looking at here. The next slide is going to be just of the Rhinevilla Point area. So shown here is a cross section that it took me about five weeks of field work to do this. We started off with the LIDAR data image for what it's worth. All the vertical lines on this cross section are um, where we have stratigraphic columns and the resolution doesn't show up very well. But we're measuring centimeter scale stratigraphy here. In terms of the cross section, it's vertically exaggerated, so at about, I think, five to one. So we have 25 meters thick, and it's about 450 meters wide. The ch sediment transport system is directly entering into the screen. So you're looking at a perfect cross-sectional view of the stratigraphy. The yellow colors represent coarse grain sandstones, whereas the earth tones are finer grain rock. Let me show you what this outcrop looks like. So if we're looking here at the left side of the system, you'll note here that you can see the left side of this beautiful, this is channel 3 or C3. You can see all the bedding and stratigraphy in there. 
we look at the other side of the system, you can see a beautiful little pothole right, whoa, there's a mouse. There's a pothole right here, and that's filled with shale class conglomerate, and then there's a lot of structuralist sand above it. But again, I want to emphasize how visible the bedding boundaries are. Another thing I want to emphasize here is that we've color-coded the surfaces by the amount of erosion on them. So you'll note on the stratigraphic cross-section we have bold red lines. Those indicate surfaces that have a high degree of erosion, and the, uh, the, the blue lines are just uh, have less. And so what you'll note here is the system is moving around quite a bit in terms of the, the different channels are compensating a lot. However, if we look within the channel, what we see is significantly less offsets between the units. And that's, those are depicted with the black circles. And then at even smaller scales, we see more vertical aggradation. Let me, we're going to compare that with this other system here, which is Kilbaha Bay. And what you'll note here is that the system is much more tabular. The stratigraphy is far more tabular. And again, the bedding surfaces are very well exposed. And so for clarity, what we see here is a lot of compensational stacking. The system is shifting around a lot. And what we're going to do now is take that and quantify it. But just for clarification, we're looking at architecturally distinctive parts of the fan. We're looking at updip and downdip areas reflected by Kilbaha Bay and, pardon me, by uh, Rhine Villa Point and Kilbaha Bay, respectively. So here's the model outputs, basically. <clears throat> what we learned here is that if we look at the graphs representing Rhine Villa Point, what we see is the compensation index increases from small to large scale from 0.43 to 0.81, in the same way that for the small to large surfaces in Rhine Villa Point, or pardon me, at Kilbaha Bay, which is predominantly lobes, we see the same process operating, in that compensation is increasing with, with size. In the same token, we see that compensation increases in the downfan direction. So the point here is what we've done is we've measured the absolute compensation index for a stratigraphic system, which we can later use to compare with outputs from models. We have not yet done that, but what I'd love to do is work with Michael at some point in the very near future is to ask him, what is the compensation index based on this rules-based model that you have, and how does that compare with the natural system that we have? Now, I don't mean to infer that this system that I worked in Ireland represents the natural variability of systems. I have two PhD students that are working on other submarine fans with varying sizes and shapes to see if the boundary conditions of the basin affect compensational stacking as well. So the point is that we just have a methodology that can be used to address a number of questions. We have, an out, we have a, a methodology also that can be used to compare stratigraphic stacking patterns and outcrop with those from, from numerical outputs, at least that reference surfaces. So another thing I'd like to do is propose just another simple idea in the last few minutes that I have. And that is that Doug Edmonds, who's in the room here, presented a geometrical model that evaluates how water depth and gradient influence the stratigraphic architectures of deltas. So imagine a cross section through this delta going from up dip to down dip. And shown here is an output in, in or the, one of the figures from Doug's, Doug's um, model here in which the cross section of the delta is shown to spatially change from being a lot of top set stratigraphy, which is shown here in the dashed areas, transferring to a lot of four set stratigraphy. This is very intuitive, but it's, and I find it ironic that field geologists and stratigraphers for many years were using this bottom model, which basically shows no longitudinal transfer or change in stratigraphic architecture. So the idea here is if you were to quantify the area above this black dashed line here, you would see that this is all top, predominantly top set stratigraphy above it, whereas that basin word or below it is predominantly four set stratigraphy or the mouth bars themselves. So when I read this paper, it gave me a lot of ideas in terms of how we can quantify stacking patterns in outcrops. And particularly, one thing that I wanted to learn is how shallow water deltas, or those prograding into relatively shallow water, have different architectural styles than their deeper water counterparts. I'm going to show you an outcrop example of that in just a minute. But the idea here is this is a diagram based on the geomet geometrical um, input characteristics that <laughs> that's great. The geometrical input characteristics that Doug proposed. And the idea here is that the shallow water delta has a long component of its longitudinal transect that's predominantly top set stratigraphy, whereas the deeper water counterpart has a comparatively lesser amount of top set stratigraphy. Therefore, the stratigraphic architectural styles are very different. And so right now, we're working in the book Cliffs, 
This is a photograph from Helper, Utah, and this is Mark Kirschbaum, who works with me at School of Mines, a cross-section that he put together. And what we're working on is we're comparing, this is the Manka Shale, and these are a bunch of plastic wedges that are prograding into the, into the basin in here. This is about a 200 kilometer long transect through the stratigraphy. The gray areas are marine shale, yellows are coastline strata, and all this other buff colored is, is shallow, or pardon me, fluvial strata. And what we're actually gonna, what we're doing in the field is we're comparing an updip shallow marine system to its deeper water down dip component out here, which looks something like this. So in the updip area, we see a delta that is prograding into about five meters of stratigraphy of, of water, whereas the deeper water counterpart is prograding into about 20 meters of, of, of water. And what we're doing in the field is actually measuring the different facies types that we have there, as well as the different architectural styles to first of all test Edmonds' model, but then also be able to describe how heterogeneity, how different processes are operating in these two deltas of comparatively or reasonably similar ages. And so then the idea here is that this approach can be transferred to and for models, not just the types that Michael Pert shows or the, or the more process-based models that Irina and Doug have used, but what we can do is test efficacy and uncertainty through these numerical methods that we're using in outcrop as long as they can be compared and transferred to model outputs. And so, in conclusion, what I'm proposing here is that the more that we work together, the more that we talk together, that will enable us to develop common workflows as a means to relate results of numerical modeling to natural systems, and particularly outcrops in this example. And I think what this relies on is a conversation, so let's keep talking about this. But another thing that, besides model validation, in terms of ocular, it's, it's an improvement over ocular comparison. We have a quantitative way of comparing natural and numerical models. But the other thing I'd like to really share is that coupled perspectives provide insight that can be used to develop new questions. And I would say in both of the examples that I showed, the compensational stacking as well as the, the delta example, these are perspectives based on modeling that I never would have had as a field geologist. No, maybe other field geologists that are smarter than me could have done that. But I needed the help of these numerical model outputs. And then I can go out in the field and test them and then build upon them, hopefully. And we can work together as a team to develop common workflows to address efficacy and, and ask new questions. So with that, I'm showing you some other photographs of the Ireland outcrops that we worked. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I think it's very, very important work, and I'm very interested um, in this work as well. Uh, what I got a little lost on was the uncertainty. Um, you know, this is something I, I, I very much appreciate as well. Um, it seems you're working with three things, tank experiment, process model, and then outcrops. What Michael Purge does is more process mimicking model. It's not really a process model. It's actually a statistical model. So I'm a little bit worried about the horse and the carriage. What sort of comes yeah. first is that uh, how are you going to compare a statistical model which requires statistics and where would they come from? They would come from your outcrop. I have also a couple of questions about scale, comparison of scales. You're looking at things that are at very different scales. So, and, uh, so maybe a few comments on that would be, would be great. Okay. Maybe you can have a talk So after. with regard to uncertainty, I'm going to use the same answer that our first speaker used, which is that I will <laughs> there's a lot of uncertainty in what, what we do here, and I won't be able to necessarily address that. In terms of comparing, uh, uh, comparing our measurements from a natural system to what Michael Perch does, it, indeed what he has is a rules-based model. And what we can do is look at measurements from a natural system to test if the assumptions that we're des designing the rules-based model yield similar results. So in other words, if their assumption is that all sediment transport systems always go to the absolute low, that might yield a compensation index that's a little bit different than what we saw there. Because you'll note, in all the systems that we saw, there was a lot of aggradation of the stratigraphy, meaning that it was kind of staying focused. So I think it's a, a method by which we could refine assumptions for rules-based modeling. And as far as the process models, again, I think I would say that this is a place that we should be talking that uh, do, the, do the process, do the outputs of process models match that of, of natural systems. So I, I'm kind of punting your question, but the idea is that the outcrop 
my perspective as a field geologist is very empirical. I just have to correct what event-based modeling is for. It's not for this. It's, an, it's designed to take criteria and use it at a reservoir scale. It's not for this stuff. Well, I would argue that what we did was work at this reservoir scale. But we're, we use other things than that. Hi, I'm a groundwater hydrologist, and so and started out as a geology undergrad. And um, my goal was always to use the geology to constrain the groundwater models, just like you're you're being paid to do this by Chevron, and I'm sure what they're hoping, right? And they're hoping for, to be able to take this and constrain and understand oil flow in the subsurface. Now, so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the utility, utility of your analysis to achieve those kinds of goals, a more predictive model in oil or water flow in the subsurface. Well, you know, w one thing that we're working on is the more that we know about natural systems, for example, compensational stacking is one important way that you can juxtapose the sand-rich parts of a channel to the sand-rich parts of another channel if it's not very compensational. So if we see that a system is kind of sticky, that means that the sand and sand contacts are enhanced and, they're, they're, and also there would be perhaps better connectivity. But then again, this is not, what we're doing is we're being very empirical. What I would argue is that if you're going to make a, a reservoir model or a hydrological model of some sort, that if your model matches that of what we're seeing in natural systems, then you can run the fluids through it and see how that, and populate it with your permeability and porosity fields, that you'll see how much of an imprint this really has. And that's, you know, we're in the early stages of this, obviously. But there are certainly applications, yeah. Really nice to see what you do. Thanks. Thanks.